For the past three years, I have been squeezing everything I could from good old Blender. My sole focus was to produce large-scale environments full of detail, at least somewhat believable and as epic as possible. Either for my own short film or for the CG Boost Master 3D Environments course, I've tackled deserts and mountains, skies and oceans, wetlands, highlands, arctic scenes and more. In the process, I have learned so much. Now, two years after the release of the course, I've put together a list of 10 things that I feel like I haven't mentioned enough in it and that, in general, will help you in your own environment work in Blender. So, let's dive in. By the way, this environment I created specifically for this video and it's a combination of maps that I got from CG Trader, actually created in World Machine software, and I put everything together in a blender scene. The little trees I created using the scatter add-on, using the library called Alpha Trees that is available for it. So yeah, it's not really an environment featured in the course, but if you're interested, you can check out the breakdown for it at my personal channel here on YouTube. Also, as you may already know, to celebrate Zach's birthday, our courses are currently 30% off. Just pick any one of them and at checkout type in HBD22 to get your discount. So, happy birthday, Zach. Oh yes, I know, this is a staple in almost every environment focused and actually any other 3D art tutorial out there. Gather reference. Every 3D artist should already know this, right? But you know what? I decided to include it all the same to mention this one thing. Not only gather reference, but also actually study it. I know that I myself have been very guilty of omitting reference studying in the past. I had all these wonderful photos and images in a file somewhere. And yet, I often just sort of kept fiddling with the shading, texturing, lighting and atmospherics based mostly on my imagination. Don't get me wrong, imagination is a beautiful thing, in all cases but one, when trying to achieve some sort of realistic result. But let's get more specific, for there are specific things you should look for. For example, observe the way atmosphere fills the landscapes in different times of day. The way different types of vegetation are distributed along different parts of the terrain. See how lighting spreads and bounces over large-scale terrains, how it creates light streaks and how the air is filled with little particles. Look for differences in size and how large an average tree is compared to, say, a mountain. Study how foam forms on the ocean and how water rippling looks from a very large distance. Actively dissect everything you notice about your images. Or, even better, take photos yourself. The longer you do this, the better your results will be. Guaranteed. Also, if you do not already, use PureRef for gathering reference images. You will thank me later. Making large-scale environments is a very time-consuming job. It may take days, even weeks. And that was certainly true for most of the environments for my course. Chances are, in the process, you will get bogged down by details. There is always a lot of them to solve. Uh, where to get tree particles, how to add atmospheric effects, how to optimize the render, and hundreds of other questions. That is why even the simplest concept comes in handy. It may be just a collection of those reference photos you've collected, with some added notes on what you like and dislike, or a little pen and paper scribble, or even a full-blown concept, which, by the way, doesn't even have to be yours. ArtStation is your friend. Or you can even generate it using the new AI systems like Midjourney. If you have an idea and want to achieve it, having some concrete depiction of it that you can always return to and course correct along the way is unbelievably useful. It will shape your idea, give it solid contours, and those will direct your plan. So don't underestimate it. This next one is of course connected to the previous point. It is extremely useful to figure out what will and will not be visible in your shot early. After that, you just cut out majority of the elements that are outside of the shot. Having hundreds of thousands of objects that will never be seen is just wasteful. Therefore, I always recommend figuring out how the camera will move through your shot first, using even a quick block out with simple objects. Of course, you can keep adjusting this move and even changing the whole composition later. When creating landscape shots that feel large, it also helps to understand a bit about camera work. And it isn't even something too difficult. 
Generally, the higher you go with your focal length, the more narrow the shot will feel, the flatter it gets, and usually the less epic. Let's see an example when we go down from 50mm, which is more or less a standard focal length similar to human eye, and bring it to about 30 or less. See how much more of the shot we span? And now it looks like the distance between the point in front of a camera and this point in the very far back is much, much larger. Compare it to a very long lens of about 100 millimeters. That's a different story, right? One psychological trick I do sometimes when I want to really underline the feel of awe and even add a bit of vertigo is I key the focal length to gradually decrease over the span of the shot. Very small decrease, usually just around one millimeter every 200 frames. It is subtle, but the audience will feel it. Just don't overdo it to not make them puke. One more point to camera work. Usually you want to make your camera flybys relatively slow. A rule of thumb, imagine a cameraman in a helicopter flying through your environment. The larger it is, the slower the perceived movement. Making your camera move faster than natural makes the environment feel less epic. In other words, even in this case, it helps to have some sort of human scale reference, even if it is just in a form of proper camera movement speed. A very dramatic effect you can add to your scenes is a simple shadow on the ground. See how much more epic a scene gets just by making some areas highlighted and others clouded in shadow. By the way, this is one of the reasons why scenes in Ridley Scott movies are often so damn cool and epic in scale. Having these shadows slide along the surface of a vast scenery just makes everything so much better. To achieve it, I usually just make a really large plane with holes in it. A gobo, uh, no, not hobo, as it is called in movie industry. And I then place it in front of my light sources. I've talked about this exact technique in my previous videos here on YouTube, so definitely check out some of my breakdowns. Oh, and there is now even a great add-on called, well, Gobos. And you can now get it at Blender Market with a special CG Boost discount. See the video description for more details. One of the most important elements you may want to study in those reference images of yours is how the atmosphere fills distant vistas. Really, one of the most common reasons student renders fail to achieve realism is that their scenes do not have proper atmospheric fog. My advice, if nothing else, nail this thing. Especially focus on how the fog and haze change the color of your distant scenes, tinting them to blue and white, or possibly yellowish and brown if we're talking about dusk and dawn. You have all sorts of ways to do this, either fill your scene with volumetrics, you can check this setup, or you can even learn about that in my previous tutorial here at CG Boost, or composite it in as a mist pass. Also, do not forget, everything gets kind of blurry in the distance, so do not make your background mountains as crisp as your foreground. A little hint of blur is enough though, so don't go overboard. All this is best done in compositing, so I'll refer to tip 10 later in the video. If you plan on scattering thousands of assets throughout your scene, make sure you know what you're scattering. Meaning, make sure you've optimized these objects. I mean, sure, using particles and children is much more efficient than flooding your landscape with individual duplicates. Still, it has limits and going above 10,000 of any particles usually causes Blender to scream in pain. That's why we always want to make it easier for our favorite open source software by, for example, decimating the source particles as much as possible. If you know that they will be only visible in the far distance, you do not need to have too many details on it. Same goes for textures. Ask yourself how big you want your particles to be in the scene and chances are they will be this small. Well, for such size, you really do not need 4K, 2K or even 1K resolution textures on your particle trees. Often, you will in fact get away with 512 or sometimes with 256 pixels for these. With these amounts of small particles, no one will really notice the difference in quality. And your renders will get incomparably faster. And this is really a general point that goes to all the textures you're going to be using. Having even a few 4K ones in your scenes will impact your render times in a huge way. Always keep that in mind and make sure you keep those resolutions down wherever possible. 
having a very large 3D environment with hundreds of thousands of objects is one of the most difficult things you can attempt in Blender. It just gets slow. That's why, inevitably, from a certain stage of layering details into your scene, your process will start focusing more and more on saving performance rather than a simple artistic expression. A big part of saving as much memory and computing power as possible is by using 2D images instead of 3D objects. For example, literally all of the skies in the Master 3D environment course shots are simple 2D images. Many of the very distant elements are image planes, so are many of the clouds, and the fog elements are mostly made of 2D image sequences. Heck, this whole desert scene is made out of nothing but planes. Okay, technically, the front one doesn't count since it's displaced, but hey, originally, it is a plane. In the course, I even teach you how to make a 3D tree into a 2D plane with some dynamic normals and translucence. In other words, always consider whether you really need a full-blown 3D object where a simple 2D plane would suffice. A rule of thumb, the further away from the camera the object is, the less perspective shift there is, and the less need for a 3D element. Connected to the previous topic, if you do start using photos for your skies, always make sure to respect the horizon line. For example, if your horizon is visible like this, and Blender is real easy to imagine by just using the floor grid, you do not want to choose an image that is very obviously taken from the ground up. You instead want to go for another one where the horizon line is clearly visible. This is much better, isn't it? I see a lot of students making this error, so that's why I really wanted to mention it here. Nailing the horizon line is usually a problem more typical for concept artists who decide to paint everything from scratch. Establishing a clear perspective grid is a very important challenge for them. In 3D work, it is much easier, since we already have perspective established by just simply creating a scene and putting a camera in it. It's all the more important to respect it, then. And it's not just sky images where it's important. If you, for example, want to put very distant mountains in your scene, you do not want to place them too high, unless they're supposed to be very, very tall. Still, you can feel there is something unnatural about the placement this way. In relation to this, you may also want to study the natural curvature of Earth. Because unless you're making a concept art for the Halo games, chances are you want your distant elements to go gradually lower and lower in your scene. Again, if you're starting out, it is best to abide by the real-world reference, even if you're making an alien environment. That way, you'll have a much better chance of making your renders look just right. I think I'll never stop mentioning this one, because it is huge. A technique that will allow you to render even the heaviest of scenes in Blender is simply to dice them up into layers and composite them together later. Those layers can be as simple as foreground, midground and background, which is usually the very basic setup I use. Once you gather all the objects from the appropriate distances into collections, you can start dicing everything to render layers. The exact way on how to do this I've detailed in this Introduction to Compositing tutorial, which you can watch for free here on YouTube. Using compositing to put your scenes together is not just good for allowing renders that would otherwise be impossible for your machine to render out. You can even blend the layers much better in compositing, correcting colors, even adding more 2D elements and lighting effects. And it's safe to say my final shots wouldn't be the same without it. Also, do learn how to optimize your scenes and their render settings. I have special lessons on that in the third chapter of my course, and if you check this video's description, you'll be able to watch them for free. So, there you have it. 10 tips that I've gathered over the months of focusing majority of my time on this topic. Yes, they are more of a general sort, but those are often even more useful, especially after you figure out your technical workflows. And if you want to learn step-by-step -step techniques on how to create environments such as these, my environment course is available for you at cgboost.com. And with that, stay creative, my friends. And until next time, Martin out.